Hey everyone, welcome to the Martin Rinson edition of Scuttlepuck. I'm excited to have friend of the show, Al Mitchell from The Athletic and TSN 1260 back on the show today. Uh, Scuttlepuck is sponsored by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people get lower rates on their life insurance. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like hockey players, runners, strength trainers, vegans, and more. Go to healthiq.com slash SPH to see if you qualify. And now we'll get to the show right after Anakin Slade sings an homage to the Montreal Expos, Al's favorite ball team of all time. The song, Remember. I would like to share this with the people in Montreal that, that are not going to have a team anymore. But my heart and my my, my, my ring is with them too. This one's from the Spurs. Montreal. Yeah. Annie Slade's got the springtime blues real bad. Can't help but reminisce about the great years we had. I remember photo day 83 summer. Yeah, I still have to pick up me, my pops, and my brother. I remember all-star game, five fans strong. 59,000 fans looking on. I remember tears at the kids' last game. Stood right behind him as the anthem played. Now my homemade sign's got his autograph name. On the newspaper cover, first rush with fame. I remember singing Valderie, Valderall. 03 wild card race, last hurrah. I I remember Vlad 40-40 in the call, they got long. The game against the Braves, Cliff Floyd going long. Still missing Montreal ball six years on. Yeah, sometimes you don't know what you got till it's gone. Okay, and welcome and... Um, Bit of a different format to the show uh, with Dale away on vacation. Um, we weren't able to hook up on the weekend, so we delayed the publishing of the show, though I did uh, record an interview with a friend of the show, Al Mitchell, from the Lowdown with Low Tide, The Athletic, TSN 1260, um, which was just fascinating. We dug deep into the Oilers. So what I'm going to do, uh, we'll go straight to that interview and then... Uh, uh, we'll do a little mid-roll ad for Health IQ, and then we'll get uh, with Dale uh, right after the interview for basically our typical episode, just a couple of days late. So thanks for listening, and here's a great interview with Al Mitchell. So hello, and back on the line today, we have a friend of the show from The Athletic and TSN 1260, Al Mitchell. How's it going, Al? I'm very well. It's uh, It's sunny and cool here. By cool, I mean so cold i don't want to go outside <laughs> so this is in edmonton what is the temperature today i my wife said it was minus 40 and she's either <laughs> trying to scare me to death or telling the truth one of the two oh. it's cold it's very very cold yeah that uh that's uh freeze the snot in your nose cold yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's, i hope i think we're moving cold is what it is <laughs> that's right i hope you don't mind uh i used uh the friend of the show, you haven't copyrighted that or anything, is it? Like, no, I'm not, not going to have been, TSN been, lawyers calling me. And <laughs> I've been working on copywriting it, but nobody will return my call. So, yeah. you know, I think you're safe. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> hey, um, so we talked earlier this year about uh, with great optimism about the Oilers, um, and uh, and now we're really talking about the draft as an Oilers fan. So, what's the what's the vibe like in Edmonton? these days it's wildly unhappy and and uh and i think because of last year and and the the feeling that okay the world is better now and and playoffs will be an annual event the 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 rage and the outrage and really the 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 and i'm not gonna say mean spiritedness but something along that line uh, edmonton oiler fans have gotten to a point now if you disagree with them uh, you're you, you're beyond stupid, and, and <laughs> everyone has a right to tell you that. So there's, I think we're seeing the breakdown of society really among Oilers fans. Where where uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw people punching at the 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 um, shopping center, at the the grocery store here soon. It's it is a bad deal. I have to say, as a as a, a fan of this team since 1972, this year might be the most difficult for the fan base in terms of being able to come to grips with expectation versus what they're seeing on the ice. It's a veritable Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> it, really, it really is. I'm uh, I'm moving. No, I said uh, no, I'm not. But uh, the the it, it makes it difficult, really, to, honestly, to have a, a a sane conversation. I found it more uh, difficult this year to to find whatever 
reasonable is, and that's sort of what what my blog is based on. Is you, you know you're 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 trying not to overreact to things that as fans we all overreact to. Uh, but you know, and part of it is on the organization. They have sent a lot of wave, a lot of talent away, and a lot of the bets they've made did not work out. Uh, I think I think fans are maybe missing some big points like. You know, Conor McDavid is signed for another eight years after that. This one, Leon Draisaitl remains here. There's a lot to like about this organization and team moving forward. Now, it's very important that they get this summer right, and I think that's where we could have a reasonable conversation. But I'm not sure that that fans are interested in that, at least not yet. Well, um, you are. Uh, I do. I love listening to to your show every day and and read the blog because you're always the voice of reason. You're the the, uh, the the calm one and you you rationalize things and you, you always put a reasonable argument however recently uh, after the five nothing blowout to the sabers um, there was uh, quite a rant um, now had you planned that out did you think okay I gotta go off on this or was that just pure emotion no it was you know I planned it as as uh, what I had three bullet points I was going to talk about uh, one was the, about the penalty kill which I ended I had about t- 30 words written, and I, I ended up just saying it could go to hell. Which, <laughs> that was I guess beautiful. That was the, the summation of it. Uh, I, I really felt like that was the third 5 nothing uh, loss since January 1st, and, and fans deserve better. And I, had, I, I, and I had planned on saying that, and I think I did say that. Yeah. But, I, you know, the, the penalty kill, you know, a lot of penalty kill is hard work. And, and just, you know, playing smart, remembering things, forcing the issue – and I mean, I can't explain it. The, the the penalty kill overall is not bad on the road, but at home, and I don't know if they're squeezing their sticks too tight or or whatever the case may be. But the, the frustration level from the fan base uh, is is real and palpable. And so I, I at, at some level, I probably just caught caught up on that. I, I wish I hadn't done it. I, I I think whenever you yell and act like a lunatic, you're wrong. Right <laughs> as soon as you start doing it, there, there's always going. There should be a, uh, you know, the part of your brain that kicks in and goes, yes, of course, but it's only a game, or these guys are trying their hardest, which I know they're doing. Uh, but that particular day, I, I guess the, the 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 fact that they had been so bad, like that was a bad hockey game, and in the middle of a pretty nice group of hockey games, uh, the Oilers are a mysterious team this year in a lot of ways, and and their inconsistency of their of their performances, I would I would say is is a big one. They are not capable of playing uh, ten games in a row uh, that that give consistent quality, and and that yeah. is an issue, and it has to be a concern. And I don't know if that's coaching or managers or 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 uh, players, but I think all three will pay a price because of this year. Uh, there's going to be changes, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yeah, I, I think so. And well, speaking of that, speaking of management, um, I wanted to put you on the spot a bit, but say, I mean, we can all, it's easy to just be angry because they're not winning. And, and I've had my share of nights or rants on Twitter where I'm like, I mean, seriously, you guys, but um, let's imagine Peter Shirelli has stepped aside and you get made GM for a day. I've got some ideas on what I would do beyond the obvious, but what to, what would you change? Like going into the summer now, uh, I think it's fair to say the season's done. Well, what what changes do you make? Uh, the first thing I do is I don't talk to media. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> I would. I I think whoever takes over, the number one thing that that uh, has to be addressed is some of these no movement clause contracts have to go away. Uh, Cam Talbot, Andrew Sekera, Chris Russell. Milan Lucic, I think that's four. There may be others that I've forgotten about. Uh, but they boxed themselves in so badly, especially on defense, where where it, even if the cap goes up to $80 million, you are still somewhat limited because of the no-movement clauses. So uh, as much as I believe Cam Talbot was a very good acquisition, he does have, I think, a, there's, there's a little movement in his no-movement no this year. He would be a guy you might have to consider moving out simply because you need to lose some salary. Ideally, you could go to a Sekera or a Russell and ask if, if they would waive their no movement clause or, or uh, Milan Lucic. Uh, I think all of the players who have uh, long term deals with this organization have quality to them. Uh, I think that Talbot probably covers his salary. 
uh, more than the others, but they all have varying degrees of, of things that they bring that are unique. But th- there's, there's almost no way for the Edmonton Oilers to use money uh, as, an, a, a, as a way to attract free agents uh, enough so that they can address that. And that likely means trading someone of real value, like a, a, a Clefbaum or a Nugent Hopkins, uh. or going into next year with a team that you, you sort of know at the starting gate isn't good enough to make the playoffs. And I, and I do think fans will, will not tolerate that. So, so yeah, that would be probably, a, sorry, that would well, be a I really mean, tough sell, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. But I, I think Peter Shirelli's in that spot now. Yeah. I, I don't think ownership is going to allow him to, to move Nugent Hopkins or, or uh, Clef Baum or any of the young, valuable players. Uh, he, he doesn't, there's not enough money uh, available to him to get the guys. You know, if you could get John Carlson uh, and you could get a scoring winger, uh, then, then maybe you're looking at, at a team that can do some things. They just don't have enough money uh, available to them, even with an $80 million cap. They've, they've, they've sunk themselves uh, with the amount of money that they're spending with the established roster next year. So uh, the first thing I would try to do is get rid of one of those new movement clauses. Uh, ideally, it would be Sekra, not because he's not a very fine player, because he is, but he's uh, a little older than the young group that they have pushing up. And with Nurse's progress the year, this year, along with Clefbaum, uh, probably an area left-handed defense where you could afford to to give up quality to get something back. And in this case, it would be it would be cap room. After yeah. that, I, I think the the list is pretty s- simple. They need some penalty killers, some veteran guys. Uh, they need a shooter on right wing to to force. Uh, uh, young Kyler Yamamoto to the minors until he's ready. Uh, I, they need to find a way to get Paul Yarby on the McDavid's line and Leon uh, as his own second line center, uh, and that allows Nooch to center a third, possibly offensive scoring line, depending upon how they decide to line up. And and you'd like a right-handed puck-moving defenseman, not necessarily a shooter. I know everybody's talking about, you know, you need another Sheldon Surrey, except he's a right-handed shot. I don't, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think Petrie's got three goals in the last two games. He doesn't have a monster shot, but he can get it through, and he's mobile, and he can pass the puck. So uh, a righty who can do that would be my solution. Yeah. It's not it maybe as exciting as others would think it would be, but I don't think they're that far away. They just have to stop bleeding young talent off this roster. Oh, amen. And uh, I think that that's what I've been saying, is just to get a, a, young, a puck moving defensive for the right side like I, I love Adam Larson um, say what you want about the trade or whatever but I like the way he plays He's a big mean um, tough defenseman and you need that but you also need puck movers you need guys and that seems to be more and more the model for defensemen so I'd like to see them get that but where I would focus very much is spend Kate's money on stuff that's got not to do with the cap so like I I like Cam Talbot, and it's it's hard to get a goalie you can count on, and I think he's got the tools. So I'm like, whatever it costs you to go get Mitch Korn out of Washington as a goaltender coach, like or whoever the best goalie coach is in the world, pay whatever it takes and get him there so that we don't destroy another goaltender. Because <laughs> it, it is tough to play goal, I think, for the Edmonton Oilers. The 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 the. The teams that have good goaltenders year in, year out often are also good defensively. And the Oilers, you know, and look, they've had a lot of injuries. I, I actually quite like the Oilers' defense, except they do need that, that second-pairing right defender. But I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm an Adam Larson fan as well. Uh, and, I, and I really like Darnell Nurse's game, and he's really mm-hmm. stepped forward. Oscar Clefbaum's been hurt, but I like his game too. There's a lot to like about that defense, but Secker has been hurt all year long. Excuse me. He's not where he needs to be. Uh, Chris Russell, ideally, he'd have him on the left side. Uh, but even as a as a right side third pairing guy, I I think he'd be more than adequate. There's there's just they have. It's like having. Uh, they used to have six defensemen who were third pairing guys. Now they have four defensemen who are second pairing guys. And then and then, but they've got too many guys signed. Like I like Brandon Davidson, but I don't know how they keep him. Uh, because they're going to have to move somebody off that off that group yeah. uh, to add add probably a righty. So it, it's uh, it's unfortunate, and and I and I hope the owners use this deadline to to maybe bring some clarity to the roster because it's it's a jumble right now. It's 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 maddening that there aren't one or two moves that you can make to to get the team in a position where they can really add something of value just for money. Because it looks to me as though there's going to be some nice free agents out there. 
And, and my belief is if you went to a right winger and said, hey, would you like to play with Connor McDavid? <laughs> likely the answer is yes, if the money's there. Sign me up. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you did write uh, recently, I, I believe on, on your blog, Low Down with Low Tide, that uh, you felt that you, you foresaw or you envisioned that Gretzky at some point is going to be the next GM. Now, do, do you still think that? And, and where is that coming from? What is that just your gut telling you the way this is going? Uh, the, the it started out. Uh, no, we are talking Wayne Gretzky, remember, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. We, <laughs> yeah. we, we, it started out with the idea that um, you know, if Peter Sorelli, the owners don't really fire anybody, but if yeah. he moved into a different position, because that's likely what would happen. He'd he'd, he'd they'd create another title, and he'd be the guy. Uh, so so, how would the the group work? Well, I I think. I think putting Kevin Lowe back in there is a non-starter. Uh, I think Craig McTavish is a very smart man, but he would still be a very young general manager. Uh, and and Gretzky, who has no management experience at all, could be the the uh, the individual who talks to the the fans, who has input. Obviously, uh, maybe doesn't do the day-to-day work of it, but but has great input into into the um, the day-to-day workings and the and the moves that the team is going to make. The the reason why I brought it up as an example uh, is to show that even if you're mad at Peter Shirelli, the alternative, you know, if you say the alternative couldn't be worse, well, remember, this organization traditionally does not hire uh, general managers with experience or even guys who are, uh, have done the hard work of building up to become the general manager by being AGM. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know a lot of people have said Keith Gretzky, and maybe he ends up being the guy. But... The, the the owners are uh, they're a funny bunch because the owner is 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 very much a fan of the '80s team, and and I I'm not saying Wayne Gretzky will will want the job or apply for the job, but I think if something if if Daryl Cates went to him and said, look, we need your help, we're going to give you a lot of guys to do the day to day and the phone calls and all of that, but we need you to be the guy who is is the the face of this uh, organization and management. I think Wayne Gretzky would do it, and I think he would have. Uh, a lot of uh, input, and I also think that he would be very publicly uh, um, available uh, for, for, you know, he'd be the point man in that way. And I see the orders being being the, the one organization that would probably think that that was a good idea, even though he doesn't have a lot of experience. And I'm not putting him down. Yeah. I'm just saying that, that I, I'm reading the tea leaves uh, based on what the orders have done in the past, and they're, they're very much... Um, in in of the belief that that '80s team was magical on and off the ice, yeah. and I and I do think that there, if Shirelli leaves, it'll be a, a a group of people that involves Wayne Gretzky. Although I don't know what the titles are. Yeah, what I now what I envision there would be like I, I the model that the Leafs put in. So Gretzky could be the Brendan Shanahan, for example. I know Bob Nicholson's there, but um, you could have Gretzky and you could keep Shirelli. I'd personally would get rid of him, but okay. But I like what the Leafs have done with you've got Lou Lamorello, the experienced general manager, and, and no one puts anything over on Lou. But they, even before they brought him in, they hired Mark Hunter, who's your old school hockey guy, right? The guy who, like a great evaluator of talent, but also, you know, he's <laughs> no BS as they come. And he's a, he's an AGM and just old school. And then they hire Kyle Dubas as the other AGM who's a completely different mindset, a smart guy, who's the analytics guy, who gets a group of people to do that work. And now to me, at the table, you've got some really strong minds, as long as you've got someone like a Gretzky or a Shanahan, I think, to kind of keep, every, and I think Lamorello probably does that in Toronto, keep everybody going along the same path, but being able to put their strong opinions out there. Um, uh, that seems like a great setup. I just, I don't get any impression that, uh, they're investing anything in, in analytics or a team that would provide that side of information. It's just one of the tools in the toolbox that they just seem to be deciding they don't need, and that, that frustrates me. Well, I, I think I, I, I'm not sure of the state of their analytics department, and, and, I, and I, I, I certainly wouldn't be critical of it because I think the key is we don't know, even if they were the greatest analytics department in the world, whether the, the general manager listens. And and the mm-hmm. one thing I can say about the Toronto Maple Leafs in watching them is it's pretty clear that the analytics, although it may not, uh, you know, run freely as it did in the the first days of Dubas getting there, I think that first draft was brilliant. 
uh, they, they seem to have tracked back from that, uh, both of the draft and, and with the NHL team, Roman Polak being an example of it, that they, there's at least some kind of evidence that information has value, and they are proceeding as um, along those lines. You know, they've got a kid named Josh Levo who they never play, and that's too bad that he doesn't play because he does have value. But this is a really good young player uh, who's dying on the vine and probably gets traded soon. The, the owners don't, you know, they need that guy. They need Josh Levo, but they haven't done the things required uh, to, to get one of those guys on their roster because even, even if you just apply basic math to the draft, you should be able to get a, a Josh Levo every year in about the fourth or fifth round. The the Calgary Flames got Andrew Mangiapane a couple of years ago who'd fall, gone through the draft one year, and the next year they drafted him. And, and, you know, the numbers I ran showed him as one of the more promising CHL players that year just based on offense and mathematics. Well, the orders can do that. Uh, and, and, and this past year there was some evidence with uh, Safin and Maximov along with Connor Yamamoto. Mm-hmm. But you need to do that several years in a row before you before you – can, can you know count on it or or boast that it's a, a, a strength and once again the owners are at a point where uh, they're thinking about changing management again and we could go back into you know drafting big heavy guys who can skate yeah <laughs> I think we've got well, I mean that, that's what that's why the 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 uh, and I understand the idea you know fire Shirelli fire Shirelli I get that I understand it I I know exactly why people feel that way, and I don't have any argument against the the Griffin Reinhardt trade. I will defend Adam Larson's acquisition because I really like him as a defenseman, and I think the Edmonton Oilers did need something on that right side because of the Jeff Petrie trade. Uh, the Everly trade, people are are still mad at. I I think it was a a trade that needed a follow up. What are you going to do with that three and a half million dollars? And and the Oilers really didn't do anything with it, and that that can be a criticism of the organization. But even with all those criticisms of Peter Shirelli, be careful what you wish for, because the the next group up may feel that you know McDavid yeah. needs a, a you know a, a young big guy who can thunder and do all this stuff and skate and and you know has no hands. And that if you think that's impossible, uh, let me reread Edmonton Oilers history. It's they're capable of doing it. This happened <laughs> in the past. Oh, you're scaring me. <laughs> I'm, just, I, I'm saying, I like, I wish, I wish I had a better answer. Like yeah. I did. I wish, like I wish I, I. If you're asking me if I think Peter Shrelly is dumb, the answer is no. I do think that he. There, there are times when he uh, has has really made astute decisions uh, at the draft table uh, and in trade. I, I, I believe that, but he has absolutely traded too much talent away, and now he's playing catch up. And, and that's why I think they'll end up drafting a forward this year uh, in the first round because they just have to get some speed and skill uh, into that top part of the, uh, of the forward roster uh, in Edmonton in the next couple of years. Yeah, what, what, uh, recently, I can't remember if it was LeBron's uh, article or um, maybe just some stuff coming out of his breakfast there at Bob Nicholson, but he, he commented that Ryan Strom hasn't performed as expected, and I just... Uh, what did you think he was like that? That that's worries me because like, did you think he was Jordan Eberle? Because nobody else did, and those comments just yeah they they worry me that uh, he he doesn't come off as uh, ha- having he see, he always comes off as saying well you know it's really hard and we've had these problems as opposed to look we got a plan here's the plan I'm going to and I know what I'm doing you know he doesn't come off that confident he always seems to be rationalizing but maybe when they talk to him. It's after some really bad <laughs> stuff happening, so you're on your heels. Um, well, I'll give him credit for for standing in front of the of the uh, um, the fan base like that because yeah. th- this is a tough time to do it. Uh, the thing about Strom is, I I believe that he felt as most of us did that there would be some time for Strom with Connor McDavid. So yeah. Strom has I think 20 points now uh, in 50 games, something along those lines. Well, if you if you take 15 of those games and you put him with McDavid, he's probably got 25 points. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he's on his way to a 40-point year. 40-point year is about what any reasonable person could have expected. I, I think Strom had 30 points a year ago, so a 10-point improvement would be improvement. Uh, but I, like, I, I do not, I didn't dislike Strom as an Islander, and I do not dislike him as an Oiler. I, I, I think, as you say, expectations were were that he would somewhat replace 
uh, Eberle, and I never, I never really, I, I don't know anybody who would have thought that Eberle was a consistent twenty goal man, yeah. and Strom, I think, has had one fifty point season, uh, in which he was a feature player with the Islanders, and since then he's been twenty, twenty five, thirty points. I think that was the expectation, and that's what he's going to deliver. Well, that's what that's what I expected. Just when Shirelli said he's disappointed, it's like, well, what were you expecting? But um, you alluded it to there a little bit, or I'm I'm wondering, like, are Shirelli and McClellan on the same page, do you think? Because there seems to be a lot of – he's clearly not playing dry subtle where Shirelli would have liked him, but there seems to have been just the way he's been playing the players and stuff. Um, I, I wonder if he's – if they're on the same page in terms of how to use the players. The the This is the thing – this is the, this is the question of the year, and I don't have an answer for you. But I, I – and I'll use a different, you know, player, Jessel Pugliarvi. The owners are out of it. They're not going to make the playoffs unless they go on a terrific run. But this is the time to audition Jessel Pugliarvi with with uh, Connor McDavid. You've got 30 games left. That's a hell of a run. That's that's a lot of games. And in those 30 games, you might be able to you know find out yay or nay. Is this guy going to be able to play on the top line? Does he have enough chemistry with Connor McDavid? Is that an option? Uh, and and around the time when you would have done that was the point at which the coach said, you know what, I'm going to put uh, Leon Dreisaitl with Connor, and we're going to run there. And uh, to me, it's just counter to team building. So, I, 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 like, I don't have an answer for you. Maybe maybe Connor McDavid doesn't feel comfortable with Yessi Paul Yarvi. No, I don't know that anybody's asked him, and even if they did, I doubt whether you know he would you know say anything that was, was you know, uh, questionable in that regard because then it gets to are you supportive but uh, on the ice when i see them together i think they do pretty well together mm-hmm. and and might just be a matter of trust that builds i don't have an answer about where the disconnect is but based on handling of a bunch of different situations this year i do think that that there's a sense of the solutions that have been brought in aren't necessarily the ones that are that are that are preferable or or um uh, long-term answers uh, as far as the coaching staff is concerned. And when I say coaching staff, that might involve players too, but, but I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, imply too much because there's just no way to know that which, which it is, whether it's the player or maybe the, maybe the coach has been saying, man, you guys got to play together. And, and then he sees that it isn't working and they move away from it because obviously he sees them in practice and a lot of different spots that we don't see them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough job that <laughs> if I, if I oh, could, no. Sorry. Especially it's a, when your team's losing. Like, yeah. you know, the, 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 uh, there's not an easy job in Edmonton in, in, in hockey right now. Yeah, no, no kidding. I wouldn't mind. Well, this is probably a good segue, actually, because I want to take a bit of a left turn. And this week, um, TSN's Ryan Rashog got into a bit of a he, he started a Twitter storm, I guess. But uh, we'll say that um, Al Montoya was. Um, starting his his getting his first start uh, at home uh, for Edmonton and on that day uh, I guess part of his pregame is that he doesn't take questions uh, from the media and and Ryan did not like that obviously and and um, said he was fragile in his preparation and questioned his qualities as a goaltender and that just uh, uh, Twitter exploded Um, and I know you've talked to Ryan what was your take on that whole thing? I mean, I know it comes down to, are they required to speak? I don't even know what the agreement in place is. Are they, abs- is there a rule with the league or with the team or have they an agreement that says, yes, we'll make players available. Um, you know, what did you, what did, what did you take from the whole situation? Cause it was, it, it exploded pretty big. The, the initial uh, explosion, I think surrounded the usage of the word in his original tweet, which Ryan, uh, uh, you know, later tweeted and said, you know, I, I, uh, obviously I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I was, I used the wrong word or something along those lines. And for me, as someone who has used the wrong word in a tweet before, I totally get that. And I, and I uh, applaud him. And I think that people should uh, give credit that, that, you know, not, not to, you know, say that he didn't tweet it initially, but, but all you can do when you make a misstep is to uh, correct it. And, and, and he did that. Uh, and I'll, uh, you know, Ryan Rashog's a smart guy. He, I, I know that he would not have deliberately done that, uh, you know, in a malicious way. That's just not the person that he is. Now, on the on the side of, uh, uh, you know, whether or not the 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 players should talk, there is an agreement. Um, 
there is an agreement, as far as I understand, that if you're skating on game day, that you're obliged to talk to the media. That said, lots of players in the NHL uh, have established that that's not for them, a lot of them being goaltenders. And so if, if that's part of Al Montoya's preparation, then then that's part of his preparation. And, and I'm sure a lot of the media felt like that was going to be the, the – the front of the story, like the headline of the story. Montoya gets first start in Edmonton, yada, yada, yada. Uh, here's what he said about that. And so when it's not available, then, then you know, that becomes a bigger story, and it obviously did. I, I, I think the solution is something that I, I don't know what it will be, and it depends a lot on fans. I don't know how much fans care about hearing uh, from players on game day. I, I think at some point in time, if fans don't care, then a lot of these pre-game interviews are going to be available just by a, the 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 uh, uh, club uh, website and the club-driven uh, media. Uh, so so there won't be a mainstream media uh, scrum or opportunity, which I think is too bad. A lot of people do value that, but when we're when we're getting into situations here where uh, this this becomes such a big story that I think it probably is going to get reanalyzed, and then one has to ask is the is the NHLPA going to uh, you know maybe push for some kind of a, a different agreement we may see that we may see a lot of the media now is taken in-house by uh, each individual team the orders being an obvious example of that and we may say more of that uh, as uh, in an effort for, for teams to maybe protect their product or protect their players or what they perceive to be uh, and and so I I don't think this is going to go away I think that players are less uh, less likely to talk than they were 20 years ago because they're, you know, who knows? Maybe this is part of his preparation. Maybe this was him being strong in his preparation. We don't know the, st- we don't know the, the whole story, uh, and, and maybe we do eventually find out. But uh, it came up. It was a big deal. Uh, it's, I think it's blown over a little bit. Uh, but I, I, I think that, that, you know, looking back on it as it occurred, I think that there are – elements of the media that really think that's a big deal and i think they will continue to push for it until that opportunity is taken away from them if it is taken away from them yeah. and i get that like i can see um it being difficult as that beat reporter that really it's a first game in a little bit there's really no interesting story so that was the one that might have piqued fran's interest right hey montoya's getting his first start let's let's talk to him get his take on it so i could see why that would be interesting because i mean we all know you're not going to get anything uh too uh, groundbreaking from any player but that might be an interesting thing i think that the biggest issue was just um it almost the the tweet almost got personal as opposed to rishag just saying hey look this is really disappointing Uh, teams should make these guys available you know and now I don't have a the one interesting story I could have had. I can't get because the player doesn't want to do it. Right? And he kind of he kind of crossed a the line there. I think uh, a little bit. Um, but I do. I really hate the idea of all the media being just team. I mean that the, the team media because that's just you'll you'll get nothing interesting. I mean you think it's not interesting well, what I, players I, say now. You'll get nothing that's worth hearing. Then, then if you believe that, then you then you then you probably believe that Rashog at some level was in the right because what he was saying was this is something that's been established. If you're taking this away from us, then then you basically are taking all the media in house. So like that's the stick the, the slippery slope here where where, you know, uh, uh, and and from my point of view there are two different issues. Uh, if, if Mr. Rashog hadn't sent out a second tweet saying, Listen, you know, I totally get the that, you know, uh, the 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 anger and the rage would continue, but I, but I think that he, he, uh, he, he, as much as he could, he did, you know, take back what he said and owned what he said. Uh, and then after that, we're left with this issue of, does it matter to fans? And may, uh, honestly, I don't know that it does. I, I, I don't know that fans really care about hearing from players, you know, that, that are outside the, the media. Maybe, maybe after the game, it's enough to have somebody to step up and, and say something and that'll be the end of it. I, I honestly can tell you that that I've been watching NHL teams and quotes after games uh, for a long, long time. And access every every year is less, uh, and I think we're headed that way. And I, in my lifetime, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's two or three uh, uh, team interviews that are available exclusively on the team website, 
and that's what you get. I, I don't think we're, we're that many years away from that. Wow, that would be too bad. But, uh, hey, I've taken up a, a bunch of your time. On, on a big day for you, I know, it's the uh, Super Bowl, and uh, you're a big Philadelphia Eagles flans, or fan, so you got uh, big plans for the Super Bowl? Uh, yes, I, I plan on uh, the first half. I'm gonna, uh, time permitting, I'm gonna zip out uh, uh, and watch at a local watering hole uh, with uh, with a group of friends. And if it gets too, like if they're down 24 nothing by the end of the first quarter, I'm leaving. Uh, if they're down 30 nothing by the half, I'm leaving. Uh, if they're up by 12, I might stay. Uh, and then uh, I, I'm I'm ready to bolt after the anthem is what I'm telling you because I I'm <laughs> I am not, I, I I listen I'm telling you my teams in big games don't do well like that I have a history of of uh, thank God for the Edmonton Oil Kings in 2014 and the Eskimos recently because the Eagles history back to I think it was 81 with the Raiders and then 05 with the uh, uh, with the Patriots not good. Uh, the last time the Oilers won the Stanley Cup final, they they broke my heart, shot it, cut it in half, uh, <laughs> and and chopped it into little pieces. Uh, I still can't believe Pisani didn't score in the third period in Game Seven. It was so close. <laughs> Honestly, it was it's, so close. It, it's all your fault, then. Is that what you're saying? I, I'm saying that, that <laughs> uh, at this point, I don't even care. I would claim it my fault if it meant that the Eagles were going to win today. <laughs> I just I've seen. You know what? When you've seen the script roll out the same way so many times like as a fan of the eagles what how come my team makes it to the super bowl without their starting quarterback how does that work like why do why does my team have to go into the biggest game of the year without their big guy how did they get there without their big guy they got there because eagles fans are going to be humiliated on the big stage <laughs> that's the only reason it happened <laughs> it has to so, be so everybody can go, oh, what a great year they've had. Blah, blah, blah. This is a setup so that Eagles fans, <laughs> when they've lost 41-2, to two, everybody can go, what happened? And then they'll trade Fletcher Cox to the Cowboys, and I'll have to watch that for a decade. <laughs> well, I see you're going in with a lot of optimism, but being I'm a fan so sucks, happy doesn't about it? This game. <laughs> just thrilled. Because I, I, I know what's going to happen. It's going to be, it will, the second half will be, all about how Brady's the greatest quarterback ever and Hoodie is the smartest man who ever lived. <laughs> and I got to sit and watch that? No way. I am going to mow the lawn if I have to. I'm not going there. <laughs> At minus 40. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's right. right. Well, I'm, a, I'm not saying people won't call the cops on me, but I <laughs> might do it. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much. Enjoy the game. I hope it. I hope the the, the Eagles win it all. Uh, we've got a, another podcast, the Broad Street Bully podcast from Philadelphia. I've talked to a couple times, and they're big fans too. So for for you and for them, I, I do hope they win. And uh, yeah, I thank you for spending some time with us on a, on a Sunday. And I will say, if you get, uh, we'll probably publish this tomorrow. Um, but uh, you may want to check out the intro music because it's a special uh, <laughs> song just for you. Oh, I look forward to it. Okay. I look forward. Now I'm curious. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Thank Thanks, you very man. much, and uh, enjoy no your problem. game today. Wish I could have been more positive for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All right. Be good. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay, and we're back. Thanks, Al Mitchell, for a, a great interview. And uh, before we get on to the regular show and get in with uh, Dale, and hey, welcome, Dale. Thank you, Mike. I am here, and I hope I sound better. You sound great with your fancy new mic. I know. Imagine what you get when you get sponsors. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, checks in the mail. Um, the uh, I did want to say before we get into the regular show, we'll we'll do our ad here for Health IQ. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, and as a regular listener of the show will know, one of my New Year's resolutions was to lose 20 pounds. And uh, I'm almost halfway there. I'm down about nine pounds. But one of the ways I uh, keep on track with my weight loss goals is using a Fitbit and, and tracking my data. And, and and what's cool about Health IQ, Dale, is that not only can you get lower rates on life insurance for being a health conscious person like hockey players, runners, vegans, but if you're willing to share your fitness data from apps like Fitbit, Strava, or RunKeeper, Health IQ can get you even lower rates. So how cool is that? Uh, that would be cool if I had one and if I was losing weight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I am, and so there you go. But uh, now they realize the data is very sensitive, so they ensure that they keep it all confidential. But for me, I just figure 
I'm tracking this stuff anyway. And if it can save me some of my hard earned dollars, well then sign me up. So yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. Um, it is pretty cool. So you can see if you qualify for large savings on your life insurance by going to healthiq.com slash SPH and take the quiz, or you can call 1-800-549-1664 and use the promo code SPH when speaking with a health IQ agent. SPH, scuttle puck hockey. Boom. You got her. Okay. All right. So let's get on with the show, Dale. Welcome back from Jamaica, man. How are you? Oh, I don't even want to talk about, but you know those 10 pounds you lost? <laughs> yeah. I found them. <laughs> well, thank goodness. It's kind yeah. of even Steven type thing, yeah. then, I guess. The, the world's in balance. But uh, no, it was really, uh, it was great. We came back to a little snowstorm on uh, Sunday night. But uh, good good weather down there, good company. Got through the blockade out of Montego Bay, so no problems. Well, that's a good thing. Was, it, was there any sign of like heavy we, we, police presence and stuff like that? No, we did actually, the, like the bus that picked us up at the airport, we actually drove by and you would call it a little ride program, little check stop, and they had military guys there. Um, but, I mean, it was literally just waved us through. But they were carrying uh, they were carrying guns. But um, but other than that, there was no, no notice. No, at the airport, there was nothing that looked out of the ordinary. So. Well, that's very cool. Uh-huh. Good to have you back. And... Uh... Yeah, I guess that'd be quite a change going from uh, sunny Jamaica to like a massive snowstorm that we had here. <laughs> yeah, and drunk to sober. That's the other kind of big change. Yeah, how, how are you managing there? It's been a tough couple of days, but um, I'm doing it. But okay. uh, but I, I, I can't say that I'm perfect. Oh, oh nice. You, I, did, I just did crack one. It's you, a, nice. It's actually a shock top. Oh, very good. Now... I'm going to, I'm going to, can you talk for five seconds? Cause I meant to grab one and I didn't. Okay. <laughs> but I, did you get back in time to watch the uh, Super Bowl or catch any of it? No, that was in I'll tell the, I can tell the scuttle puckers why you go do that. But okay. I was actually, we were riding back in the, uh, in the truck. And so I was catching all the updates on, um, on my phone. So I was just on the score and I was getting every play and it's amazing how long, how much time there is between plays. Cause you would sit there and you would get the, you know, it's third and third and four. And then you'd wait and wait. Like it seemed like a long time, but I mean, it's because you couldn't see anything. And uh, so I did follow the whole um, fourth quarter, uh, like the last five minutes there. And mm-hmm. when they missed that extra point, I did the quick math in my head and said, they're only, they're down eight. Like, Tom Brady is going to come back and score and they're going to get the two point conversion and they are going to overtime. I was almost certain of it. I think everyone thought that was going yeah. to happen. Like it's just, it was just a given that he would come but, back. And then the, um, and the other thing is you can't, you, uh, all, again, I'm reading. Right. And so when he falls, when he, when he fumbled, it was like, you know, next play, it was like, they called them yardage, right? It's what it was like third and, 12 or I don't know what the number was, but you could tell they lost yards. And I'm like, Oh, what happened? And then it was like fumbling capital letters fumble. Yeah. So, and then that was, uh, that was near the, it was was a big play. It was quite a game though. Like, um, we watched it start to finish and I don't think I've ever watched a football game where the offense just like, there was one punt the whole game. Like the offense just up went all the way down the field. Like every time, both teams, it was crazy. Tom Brady, the greatest of all time, throws for 500 yards and loses. That's nuts. <laughs> but we have to give a shout out to uh, the guys from the Broad Street Bully podcast because oh, I'm man. sure they, they were tanked. They had to be I'm, just going out. They probably destroyed I, I, their I, city. I, I prob- they're probably not sober yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, probably, it's a good chance. But so congrats to them and congrats to Al Mitchell with the the interview you've already listened to. Obviously, the Super Bowl hadn't happened yet when we recorded that, but uh Al has been a long-suffering Eagles fan, so uh, I'm sure he was ecstatic with the win. Yeah, that win is good for the NFL. Yeah, it's always good. Now, so are the are the Patriots done, do you think, or they'd be back next year? So both the offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator have already taken full-time jobs or head coach jobs in on other teams. Yeah. So I would think that would be a fairly significant um, change that Belichick will have to but doesn't figure out. Belichick just move on and just he gets the next guy, Get brings somebody him in, else, trains yeah. him, and he just keeps going. Like they're just a machine. They're 
and yeah. what's Brady forty, but he'll still be. He Brady. was the MVP. He was the MVP of the league this year. It's right. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. So, so that will be uh, that will be interesting to see. But uh, um, let's talk some hockey, shall we? That would be good. Good, now, good, good. I guess we'll start with uh, last week. We we talked about uh, some radical ideas to to change the game. So when we start our rival league, the the, XFL uh, yes, or XNHL. X, X, I like the SPHL, the Scuttlepuck Hockey League, not to be confused <laughs> with the Southern Professional Hockey League. Um, but we did get some ideas uh, from, and, and there seems to be a theme from some of the listeners, but uh, uh, Go Brent yourself um, said that he wanted to see no offsides. Uh, and another interesting one was you can't go down on a knee to block a shot. Eh, I don't know. <laughs> It's a little contrived, right? Like that's actually got um, Bob Gainey, I think, was the first one to actually bring up that idea uh, back in the, uh, I would say, mid '90s. That you know you can't go, go down, down to block them. shots. They don't want to block them because it it was getting ridiculous, and it is ridiculous. Like so many shots get blocked, it's frustrating to watch. But I don't know how you police that. You know, it'd be yeah. so difficult to police. Um. S- add to that if it goes if it goes off of you and out of play then that would be deemed a penalty of delay a game no i can't i couldn't sign up for that that would drive me nuts no okay well it would just make you think whether you're gonna you're gonna block it you gotta do it for sure or else uh anyway yeah yeah, that would be tricky i can just see all the like inconsequential plays that would end up in penalties but um but anyway we're brainstorming here so we uh, don't want to be negative um, no, what else we so got? The no offsides, and I think you mentioned that one too, or you yeah. said no lines at all. Uh, at John Bond sixty seven, brother of mine, said um, he, he likes bare faced goalies, which is you know really moving the game forward. That's moving ahead, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's it. <laughs> in this, in the age of uh, concussion concerns and stuff like that, but I mean, hey, you'd get to you'd be able to see the players, so that'd be kind of cool. But uh, in, in all serious, he said continuous play like soccer, which I I have to think is similar to your idea, no lines. And you just basically, you know, you, yeah. and it'd be even better in soccer because the ball never goes out, except when it goes over the glass, right? Right. So your brother actually had a decent idea. No, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. I don't want to give him too much credit. But, uh, and uh, at Sober Stevens had uh, wanted to bring back a, a former NHL rule in serving the full penalty. So a two minute penalty. You're in there for two minutes, regardless if the team scores or not. And I actually think that absolutely should be brought back now, and they could. That wouldn't be that radical a change, I don't think. But to me, the NHL should do that. The only reason it ever came in was because of the power play that the uh, the Habs had back in the fifties. It's. I I think it just bring it back. I I mean, I I think yeah, that that wouldn't be hard to. uh, That would be hard to put in. Mm -hmm. So, so there's some good ones. Uh, mm-hmm. But if anyone else has some ideas, do be sure to share them with us because I think uh, I, 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 I'm looking forward to starting this rival league and I need some good ideas. Well, we better get some more funding then. Yeah, that's right. Well, Health IQ is going to keep coming coming strong as long as the Scuttlepuckers check them out and get life insurance with them. Then uh, they'll, they'll keep supporting the cause. Hmm. Um, All right. So <clears throat> I don't know if you caught some of the action last night, but I got to jump in with this. Oh God! I know exactly where this is going. Did you see Connor McDavid last night? That guy. Wipe the wipe your chin. It is. It's just. It's. It's wonderful to watch. Did you see though? Did you see the goals? I, yeah, I did. He, that one he roofed. Real. Like honest to God, you had to do. You had to look at it again. Like, <laughs> I know. How did it get up that fast? But and there was. Yeah, it was just and, incredible. And the speed and the speed that he can, in three strides make a distance between him and an NHL defenseman, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Like he is that that much faster. It was pretty crazy. And and he finally scored on a, a breakaway. Of course he he missed one or two other ones in the game, but um a, another a, a nice move on the on the third goal, the hat trick goal. And then just pure skill on the, the fourth one. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, he had a he had a good night. Yeah, that's insane. Five, so he went from twelfth in uh, in points in the league to third in in one night. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. He's only five behind Kucherov, I think now. So, mm-hmm. Are you excited Aust- about that? You sound ecstatic. Oh, Austin Matthews didn't have a bad game either. I know we get three points, two goals. Mm-hmm. I think that was it. Yeah, where was 
yeah. No, he, yeah, it was a good night all around. Yeah, a good, couple of yeah. high-scoring uh, games for our teams. I'm just wondering what uh, – where is Matthews in the old uh, point lead? And I'm not being a smart ass. I'm genuinely curious. Uh, I don't know. He I'd is, look it up on the internet. A few games, didn't he? I think he did. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jeez, I'm and sure. he was concussed. Yeah. He's not like he's way down. I I'm surprised by every. He's 47th. Hmm. He's only played 45 games, but he's just under a point a game. But every highlight package i see it seems to me he's getting two or three points a night but apparently that's not a, that's the toronto media it could be could be that yeah <laughs> ridiculous but he is he is still good at hockey mm-hmm. um, so um i did want to did you have anything to say about the all-star game you were down in jamaica so you probably didn't even see it um no i don't uh, well, I have no comment whatsoever. Not a whole lot to say, really. It was other than uh, other than that, uh, Brock Besser made how many hundreds of thousands of dollars? Yeah, I think it was like he had twenty five. I think for the winning the one uh, skills competition, and they get and they got announced. He was the, he was announced as the MVP the day after the game. No, they announced it there at the game because he got a car. Oh, oh okay. And he got the car plus I think does he get a hundred grand? It's like a hundred and twenty like grand that, yeah. or something, yeah, which is pretty good. Hey, mm. oh, well, it's a nice too day at the he's, office. And too bad he's not going to be rookie of the year. Yeah, or rookie. Yeah, well, he's not going to win the Calder. You, you never know. You never know. Um, but I, just general thoughts on it. I think it it's a the the uniforms were god awful, and all the all white ones were just painful to watch on TV, but. Uh, that's probably the most important thing. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of fun. I still bugs me when the like in, in the first games, I found the guys really didn't try. It. You know, it was just a big joke. But in the final game, they gave it a little bit more, which is good to see. Like, I get you're not going to hit guys, but I still want to see them try. You know what I mean? Like, I want to yeah. see them um, uh, really going all out. So, uh, but. It is what it is. I mean, I don't. Ex- I don't have high expectations, so it it was okay to watch. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Move on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I should say, uh, um, it's geez, it seems like quite a while now. But I want to thank the guys from the Offensive Zone podcast for having me on there. You should, uh, Scuttle Pluckers should check them out. And it's key. It's the Offensive Zone podcast. Um, there's two with very similar names out there, but they're the guys from Coventry and. Uh, uh, had a had a blast on on the show there with them, and uh, they have a something you'd be interested in, Dale, called the Beer League, a segment. Mm, where, that would be where they uh, they try a new beer, and so what I uh, arranged it with um, uh, with the one guy there where we had we didn't they no he normally brings it in and doesn't tell them what it is. Uh, this is Leggy, I believe, is the, <laughs> um, and so they. So we were emailing back and forth. We picked this beer, Spitfire, it was called. I found it in the LCBO. And then uh, they open it up, and then they raid it and everything and drink it while the show goes on. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Hmm. And so I want to thank them for uh, having me on the show. Hmm. That's a good plug. The, the yeah. beer, um, we got the rat hole. We don't need any beer stuff. That's right. That's right. We just... The beer's just it, part of it. It's just a given. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a, it's a good one too this week. Oh, is it? Oh, I'm excited. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well we'll we'll get to that, but uh, just um, without getting too much into it, um, the trade deadline's coming up. I know there's a, a lot of stuff going to be. Uh, I think the Habs are going to be big movers and shakers. But uh, the latest this week is that Rick Nash has submitted his uh, uh, no trade <clears throat> list. I think it was 12 teams, meaning there's 13 or 18 yeah, he could go to. Yeah, um, something like that. Um, but why is that such a – like, is, would not at this point, like, every team that's in a position there, would they not all be asking all their, I don't know, valuable guys to submit their lists? <clears throat> like, why is it such a big deal that Rick Nash was asked to do that? Yeah, I, that's a good question because you would think because Ottawa did it a while ago said give us your list right so you would think it would just be normal, but uh, 
Exactly. The, Adapt just normal protocol at this point of the year. And why would it be public? Like why? Like Rick Nash didn't. Maybe he would his, not go. Maybe his agent wanted to put it out there to get some. Uh, get to, and and the team probably puts it out right because if you want to get multiple teams looking. I know, but I don't think a lot of those deals go happen in the media, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure the GMs talk to GMs. So I, I, just, I just find that odd that, uh, that that was such a big deal. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. You're trying to stir up the market. I guess that's the only thing I can think of. But uh, Bob McKenzie today was reporting that the asking price is a first-round pick, a top prospect, and a either a lesser prospect or a, another excuse me, lower pick. I thought they were going to actually pick up half the salary too. Oh, I didn't hear that. Which that was a while ago. Maybe that's the, that supersedes that. Who knows, know. right? It's all part of the negotiation at this point. But mm-hmm. uh, it's I got a, I got an autographed uh, Team Canada jersey of his. Is that... I, so I just yeah. So what I era wanted... would that be? Would that Vancouver. be like the, the Vancouver? Yeah, that's signed. The... Wow, how'd you get that? At one of the Rick Mahars. No, it's another story. I'll tell you. Okay, down another one. rat hole. That's another <laughs> That's rat right. hole. Okay, put it on the list. <laughs> okay, but uh, that uh, I, it's funny when I'm. I always find it difficult to value like w- what's a, that player worth. So there's there. I, I'm assuming this got leaked because they're kind of establishing the market right now that it, you know through Bob McKenzie that it's a first uh, top yeah, prospect yeah. and another prospect. But I always find it so difficult to know. What's a good deal? Like, is he a first rounder or a second rounder? I, uh, he's what anyone was willing to pay. Well, that's true. It's like a house. What's a what's a house worth? It's whatever one buyer out there is willing to pay. Yeah, that's true. Um, what's he got left on his uh, contract? Would be the other. Uh, he's got so he is UFA exactly. after this year, so it's pure rental. Yeah, yeah seven. So that's a lot for a rental. Man. I know that's too much. Yeah. I would think so, unless you really think that he's and he knows people like they're talking about Toronto, right? Because he knows Babcock and yeah, and Babcock likes him. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he's from Toronto, so there's anyway, yeah, it's I, a, it'll be interesting. But I just can't, I just don't understand why he's the big news. Yeah, that's the Rangers leaking that and trying to anchor a little bit there. I set the set this crazy mm-hmm. asking price so that people go, oh, I, Peter Shirelli says, oh, I got him for a first and a top prospect, so I did really well. I didn't have to give that other one. <laughs> Just throwing names out there, random arbitrary names. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what else do we got here? Well, I wanted to go, we got team of the week. Um which I wanted to do the Penguins because I find that they're a very they're they're an interesting team this year, um, mm-hmm. and before we get that though, uh, with the the Penguins, uh, Mark Andre Fleury's back in Pittsburgh. Uh, That's for tonight. The first time tonight. Yeah, they were down one nothing last I checked. Um, and he gets did the, and they were going to give him his ring today, or something like that. Or yeah. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's up. He's got a shutout going on on Pittsburgh right now. Um, hmm. But I did also want to do a bit of a, and I don't know, maybe we'll do this weekly. But uh, who's hot? Who's hot and who's not? So I just uh, I found it interesting to look across the league and um, see who's who's rolling right now um, in, in both the East and the West, and who emphatically is not. And in the well, East, I'm gonna go in the East. I'm gonna hot. I'm gonna say Boston will be in there. Yep, eight one and one in the last ten. Uh, and I'm going to think like uh, Nashville. Nashville is 8-1-1 one, and one in their last 10 as well. So they are the hottest. And then mm. close behind in the East, you got Pittsburgh 7-3-0 and, oh, and Dallas 7-2-1. and one. Wow. Okay. So, so it's, uh, yeah, things are they're heating up there. But uh, things that are cooling down, you got a uh, surprise here. Uh, Ottawa. Arizona. I'm going to say Ottawa is one of them. Good bet. Yeah, 3-7-0. and oh. Arizona 2-4-4. Four, and four. Okay, that goes without saying. But then actually, get... they've got two. Actually, that's not bad. Two out of ten. Yeah, and Chicago though, three, five, and two in their last ten. They're they're struggling. Mm. And then, and another one that uh, is, well, it's interesting. But the Rangers are three, seven, and zero, oh, and they seem to be on a bit of a precipitous decline here. And interesting i have to toot my own horn a little bit here but i called at the beginning of the year the rangers to finish in eighth in their division in the metro and they are currently sitting eighth so 
Okay. Even a blind even a blind squirrel finds nuts. The odd time, yes, yes. But I'm gonna pat myself on the back because I uh, thought that was because not many people were saying the Rangers are gonna finish in eighth. I'll tell you that much. So yeah, okay. You just want to move on from that, eh? You're not gonna give me kind of no yeah, love on that. No, okay. Mm, All right. No. That's how it's, it's gonna not, be. It's not over yet. Yeah. Okay. So let's do the team of the week, the Pittsburgh Penguins. I don't know if you did hmm. any research on that, but. Uh, not a lot, no. Uh, I find them uh, very interesting because well, they're high. They're a high event team. They had 164 goals for and 162 against, so they're only a plus two goal differential. Um, hmm. But what's what I you find, just keep going. I'm drinking, so go okay. Ahead. What I find really interesting about about them is that uh, they're five on five. Like their Corsi four and, and shots four percentages are quite good. Corsi is sixth in the league. Shots four is second in the league. Their goals four percentage is 29th. They're 42% of the goals scored in their games are scored by Pittsburgh, which is so you're going, and right now they're in third place in the Metropolitan. Um, only three points or four points ahead of the uh, Philadelphia Flyers in ninth. So they're not like way out of a of dropping out of the playoffs. Um, but it's pretty remarkable that they're in, in third uh, with with those numbers. But what, how they've been doing it is they are um, – their power play, it's all special teams. Their power play is 27.57%. It's first in the league, and their penalty kill is fifth in the league at 82.8. So hmm. it's pretty uh, – they're, they're – they're, it's funny because at five on five, their play, the, the like just the overall shots and Corsi would typically tell you if this is a good team and they are a good team, mm-hmm. but they're not scoring at five on five. Their their scoring is is horrendous, and they've just been able to get over that with their special teams play. Which, mm-hmm. what does that mean going forward? Hmm, who knows? I think, I think what you'll see is their their. Special teams will probably come down to earth a bit, um, but I would think five on five play. They've they've got to be better than twenty ninth in terms of goal four. Like they've got yeah. three of the top ten points getters in the league. Phil Kessel's in second in the league in points. Did you know that? <laughs> I did. Last time I saw, he was pretty high, so that's good. It's crazy. And and Malkin sixth, and Crosby's tenth, and Crosby's been climbing fairly quickly here recently. He's on a bit of a run, so. I just don't see that goal four percentage staying that low. I got to think um, their five on five play will will come up. So I I think overall they're they're, they're good. they should make the playoffs, and I think you'll see improved performance down the stretch here overall as a team. The only question mark I see is I'm going to guess the goalies. Yeah, hundred percent. Guess what? It's always the goalies. It, it is, right? We always get back to that, right? Whether they're doing well or poorly, it comes down to goaltenders. But they've been playing. Um, Casey DeSmith, <laughs> you know him, right? And then Tristan yeah. Jerry's played quite a bit because uh, Matt Murray was hurt. Uh, he's back now. Uh, he missed about seven games, I believe. Um, and his last few games have been better. Yeah, you know, but he's not having a Matt Murray kind of year. Um, and so I think you know, I, I think their offense will straighten itself out. Their five on five play. Uh, they'll they'll get that going. Um, they won't be as dependent on their special teams, but uh, it's all going to come down to whether or not Matt Murray can get back to being Matt Murray as they go down the stretch here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what it'll be. But that's um, that's interesting. So they want to um, they want to draw a lot of penalties, and Crosby's just the guy to do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He takes a ton of abuse and doesn't get. To, I don't think he gets enough calls on him. That's my take, but. But Pittsburgh's an oh, interesting one, Dale, because we're going is. to see them play twice in a couple of weeks. I know, and we're going to share this information. Maybe we can help them. You think? Right? Think they yeah. will give up Crosby a call and say, hey. No, oh, Castle. Oh. We'll go right to Phil. Okay, all right. We'll just bring I him think, a hot dog, right, and he'll let us I was in. Gonna, I'm going to say there's a bigger, better chance of seeing uh, Castle at the bar than there will be <laughs> yeah, Crosby. true. Yeah, so... That's going to be exciting because they are rolling, and I, like I say, I think I got to think their five on five plays. Uh, their play has been good, but the results will start to come. It'll be better, and uh, like I say, if Matt Murray can can kind of 
fix his season, then uh, th- they should be strong down the stretch, I would think. I think you could be right, so okay. we'll have to wait and see. And before we go on to the rat hole, because I'm dying to know what it is, oh. um, did you see uh, the Forsberg suspension on Jimmy VC? Yes. And I actually, because last week I was stupid enough to ask whether the player safety did the videos and stuff, mm-hmm. so I actually went and watched them. They're hilarious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that they're meant to be funny, Dale. <laughs> they show the head and he coming around the net. That is interference, is what he says. The player is ineligible to be hit. That is interference. Yeah. Um, it clearly was. Like, there was there was no... You didn't need a stopwatch to figure out that, that the puck is long gone on that one. Uh, so he deserves... He deserves a suspension, but I don't. I think that was the right number. I, I didn't see that one being as awful. Yeah, and Forsberg doesn't have a history and, and all yeah. that, so I, I'm good with three. I probably would have gone five just because of the head contact. But and this comes down to something that drives me nuts and I've been on about for a long time. Just the, the like they acknowledge that it was interference, like it wasn't even in their standard. But I think even the standard they have right now is too broad. They've got to tighten it up. So unless you got the puck then you're uh yeah. you can't you can't hit the guy because it just yeah. it just keeps getting stretched stretched right and that it was it was brutal like he got all i know he, he got, didn't stick yeah. his elbow out but he got him all in the head with that elbow and that it's because mm-hmm. he went high right so i bad bad hit yep it was yeah but i'm good with two did you see the it was three. Oh, was it oh yeah yeah three yeah but did you see the hit Emelin hit on stall that didn't get anything? I don't think they even reviewed it. Um, I don't no, think so. you, oh. you told me about it, so I did go look at it. Of course, I do whatever you say, Mike. Yeah, but he just... Um, like, he crushed him. He crushed oh. him. So I actually looked and said... Um, I'm thinking, because Emelin's a... Like, he's a train, right? Like, I'm just... Yeah. I was... I, so I looked up. So how big do you think Emelin is? 5'11". No. He's 6'2", 218". Is he? Okay. All right. I was guessing. How big do you think Stahl is? Oh, he's like 6'4". 6'4", 209. Like, he wasn't like a little guy. Like, he crushed a guy he would argue yeah. is almost the same size. And he was he was bent over a little bit. Oh. But still, like, he, he saw how prone he was, and he just crushed his head. Like, how that's not at least a game if you're giving him benefit of the doubt, saying, look, uh, there are these extenuating circumstances, but, like, he's out with a concussion, I think. Oh, yeah. And it was just like I'm going. You can avoid hitting him in the head there, and you didn't. Like I, that to me is just ridiculous that the NHL would not go. Okay, we've got to send a message here. And Emlyn's been uh, right on the ragged edge many times. So I, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, he, you know, you you Google him, and then you just see all the other hits that he's been involved with, and yeah, he, he's he's known he loves that big hit, and mm-hmm. he probably. It'll cost them dearly the next time. I'm I'm pretty sure they just note that and go, okay, um, here we go. But I'm Um, not convinced they do. That's the problem I have with them. Like it's just like "Eh, okay, like I just like it's Marshawn again getting minimal with with his right. Like I just Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, you made me look at it and I watched it because I did. I (laughs) I I didn't even. (laughs) I didn't even. I didn't it because right. If it doesn't make the highlights, like how would you ever have seen that hit? Really. Yeah, so. you got to dig deep. Do your research. You know, that's that's what I'm all oh, about, Dale. You know, I'm all about the research. So am I. Rat hole. Uh, that was a good segue, huh? Mm-hmm. All right. You want me to go now? Yeah, that's what a segue is, man. Oh, okay. So you'll, you'll so, get on to it. You know, I know so, you're still new at this relatively. I am, but I got a new microphone. Yeah. You're so the now. so a couple of things. Some milestones. So Dowdy's got 100 goals, Peke Rennie has got 48 shutouts, and Gina Chara has got 1,400 games in the NHL. That's my little milestone thing. Wow. This is the rat hole. Okay. So remember a lot we talked about games, right? Wouldn't it be too bad if somebody got to like 999 games or whatever? Mm-hmm. So what do you think I did? I looked it up. You did the research. Wow. Right, and so there is a guess. So it started out. Guess who's got exactly one thousand games? You're never Dale gonna Hunter, guess. Bernie Federko. Bernie Federko, yeah, okay. First player 
to go 10 consecutive years with 50 plus assists. And then his next two, he went 45 and 40. He, he scored a lot, yes. a lot of points. I remember, he was, I remember having his hockey card <clears throat> as a kid. Mm -hmm. So then I went just the next level down. So there's a guy that's got 998 games. Okay, so I'm going to ask the next question. Name the most – name a family uh, or brothers that were four of them that played in the NHL. So four brothers that have played in the NHL. Blakers? Uh, I think there's only three of them. Oh. Um... There's only one – there's another family that should come to mind. He just got crushed into the boards. The stalls. Yeah, but that's not the right answer. <laughs> the, the right answer is the Pronovos. Of course, so, so close. So Jean, Jean Pronovo, 998 games. That would be so, tough, eh? So, yeah, Pronovo, nine boys in the family. He So Jean starts out Memorial Cup 65. Bruins, it says in his bio, Bruins sold him to the Penguins. Goes to Atlanta, finishes in Hershey in the minors can't get back for those two more games. So he's, he finishes at nine ninety eight. So what's another brother you said, which one did you say? Well, Marcel, he's in the hall of fame. Okay. He, he was in the red wings. Um, they, they got him, obviously he was from Montreal from Quebec and, uh, they scooped him from the Montreal, uh, um, net of, uh, back then in the, in the fifties. I said Claude, isn't there Claude? Uh, very good. That's coming up later. Oh. So then, uh, so anyway, Mar Marcel, Hall of Fame in 78, played 21 years, 1,206 games. He um, he played um, mostly um, in the with the Red Wings. And he was most famous bio was that he, he thinks he broke his nose 14 times. <laughs> and he was with, he got called up for the Leafs and won the, won the cup. The last leaf, the last cup, the Leafs won in '67. So oh. then there was, then there was Andre Pronovo. Andre, so okay. Joined the Canadians in '56. So you know what started in '56 in Montreal? The first of five Stanley Cups. So so he won, he he won four and got traded to the Bruins in the fifth year. So he went from the Habs to the Bruins, who were lowly. Ooh. And or else he would have had, or else, he, or else he would have had five cups. The real, the little uh, interesting thing about him, mm -hmm. his grand, his grandson is Anthony Mantha. Oh, nice. Yeah. So and you, so of course you you're doing the math here, and I've only talked about three. So who's the fourth brother? Claude. Mm -hmm. How many games did he play in the NHL? Three. Uh, okay. Why did I know his name? I was guessing then. I, I know. I don't know how you do that, but it's got a very interesting story, and this <laughs> is where the real rat hole is. Okay. 1956. He's a practice goalie for the or for the Montreal Canadiens. Right. He's older, so his younger brother's playing for them. Okay. And he's he's the practice goalie. Boston comes into town. Goalie gets hurt. The backup goalie. He's got big feet, and they can't get a pair of skates to fit him. Claude. Pronovo goes in and plays for the Boston Bruins against the Montreal Canadiens, who the team who employs him and he's a practice goalie for. What? And he shut and he shuts them out. Get so he out. Sh he shut out the Montreal Canadiens playing for a team that he had just joined like ten minutes before the game, before the drop of the puck. And he was he was their practice goalie. He was their practice That's... goalie. He Three, he doesn't play another game for three years with Montreal. He goes into a game in Toronto, like in the third period to replay because he was just playing backup. So he played, I don't know how many minutes, less than 20. He got into one more game and he got pulled in the second period. He, only, he, he was in three games, only played one complete game, and he shut out the 1956 <laughs> Montreal Canadiens. Awesome. See, that's a story Jeff Merrick would love, right? That's like right, hockey history. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. The so, Pronovo brothers, it all started with Jean Pronovo, played 998 games. So, sorry, did was, was there anyone who actually played 999 and ended their career? No, no there wasn't. I, oh, wow. Now, Bernie's was it said even one thousand, but 
I saw somewhere else where it said 998, but we'll go with the uh, NHL or the Hockey Hall of Fame uh, legend said he played a thousand. Oh, there you go. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool, that's a good solid uh, rat hole. Yeah, I thought so. Right. And uh, I'm always looking to, always got to think of a new topic, but um, I think I got one for next week, so stay tuned. Okay, but uh, hey, if scuttlepuckers have any rat holes you'd like Dale to go down, by all means, uh, reach out. Shoot, mm-hmm. us, shoot us an email to scuttlepuck at gmail dot com or uh, my Twitter handle is at thirteen mike thirty one. And what's yours, Dale? It's original. It's Dale Horde, D A L E H O A R D. There you go. And uh, obviously, you can check us out on the website. I'll put links to the um, the suspensions and non suspension hits uh, that we discussed. And I might just throw up some uh, links to the Connor McDavid goals from last night because they're just <laughs> I've watched them about a hundred times and could probably watch them all night because he's yeah, so yeah. good. He's so mm-hmm. good. Um, mm-hmm. But I do want to thank uh, Al Mitchell for being on the show. Uh, much appreciated. It's uh, he's so he's so great to interview. He just uh, he's uh, he's very generous with his time and, and a great person to listen to. And he knows so much about uh, the Oilers and just sports in general. So yeah. uh, I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, and with that, I guess I'll just say uh, if you like the show, please uh, subscribe and. Um, if you if you don't mind, go on over to iTunes and give us uh, five star ratings and reviews because that helps the show grow. All right. That is true. I've told all my nieces and nephews. Okay, because you don't have any friends or what? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else from you? No. Uh, we got to get back on track now that um, vacation is over, and then uh, yeah, let's get uh, let's get fired up for. Uh, the weekend in february when we go see the penguins yeah so it'll be it'll be a short one because like it'll only be five days till our next one but then yeah we got to work that out we're going to be podcasting probably either from pittsburgh or columbus i would think that weekend uh yeah i think we'll um we'll just surprise everybody but i'm i'm taking my microphone yeah, me too all right all right Okay, man. Good talking to you, Dale. We'll talk to you. All right. Take care. And this one's for El Presidente mowing no cap. And this one's for Space Man growing flat. And most of all, this one's for us, the fans who stuck with the team when the times are tough. Singing. Dell White and Luke Frazier, Odie Nixon, FP, Eli, and Laser. I remember the magic El Perfecto. 27 men up and down like Presto. I remember sun coming down on the field, no roof. I remember doing a jig on the dugout with youths. I remember just how close we came. 81, then the strike year, still feel the pain. I'll never forget that last night at the O. Had both arms wrapped round my dad and my bro. It looked just like that pick we took years ago. The only thing different were the tears that flow. Yeah, most of y'all must think I love the half war, but if it were up to me, I'd feel like 94. I remember the last time I checked the box score and the last sad send off from Dave Van Horn. This one's for the kid and the cat and the hawk, and this one's for Britt, Larry, Walk and the Rock, and this one's for El Presidente, mowing no cab, and this one's for Spaceman, growing Vlad, and most of all, this one's for us, the fans who stuck with the team when the times are tough, singing. This one's for Brit, Larry, Walk, and The Rock. Come on. And this one's for El Presidente, mowing no cash. Right. And this one's for Space Man, growing Vlad. Sometimes it's the little things that bring us together. That's why I'm an expo forever. Remember... Bach and Cy and LP, Hawk, Pro and Rock, Woody, Ross the Boss and the Kid, Eli, Gully, Scotty, Charlie and Scoop, the Cat and Marquise, Walk and Moe, El Presidente and Pedro, Cliffy and Rondell, and Orlando and Michael and Brian and Jose and Vladdy. You got the picture. A wealth of wonderful.